Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming out Super Bowl Sunday. Um, I'm not a big sports person, so the guy in our leasing office asked me what I'm doing for the game. I just looked at him and I said, I'm not sure what sport you're talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. I also don't have cable, so I have Netflix, so I like to see commercials. Anyway, um, so my talk is on uh, implementing ethical AI. So my goal for this talk is not just to talk about the foundations. I think a lot of us are talking about the, the basics and what we should be thinking about. But what I want to do is start developing a framework for ethical AI. What, what concrete things can we come out of a talk about AI with? Because we'll talk all day in circles about robot overlords and the singularity, but what can we do today to create a framework for understanding ethical artificial intelligence? So here's me. I'm a data scientist, a quantitative social scientist. My background and my PhD is in political science. Um, I'm hopefully defending in the next month or so. And I'm a professional do-gooder. What I like to say is I explain human behavior using data. Um, right now, I'm a senior manager at, at Accenture Artificial Intelligence, and this is what they actually have hired me to do, ethical data initiatives. Um, so it is my job to create frameworks around ethical AI, uh, understanding government regulations, um, implications for human beings, how to close the gap, and that's, I guess they wanted a professional do-gooder to do that. Uh, before you guys saw my last talk when I was here in, I believe, November, I was a data science instructor at Metis. I, I strongly encourage you, if you're interested in data science, to check out Metis. It's a great boot camp. Um, instructors are wonderful. And that's me on Twitter and my website. All right, so just for a, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, three things. First, I call it from zero to Terminator. Uh, what is the current sentiment about algorithms, algorithms and AI? Where are we now in our understanding of artificial intelligence and its impact on humanity? The second part is you know, understanding a framework for what ethical AI really does look like. So moving past the hype, you know, moving past all the crazy talk, and down to what do we really need to think about? And third is to try to approach uh, ethical artificial intelligence. So I, you know, like I said, I like to call this some zero to Terminator. So this first uh, article is from about 2015, and it talks about discriminatory algorithms. Um, the second part is, you know, can computers be racist? The human-like bias of algorithms. And Kathy O'Neill's book, which was one of the biggest books <coughs> in 2016, I believe in Laura's book club, you guys are reading it or have read it already, Weapons of Math Destruction. So 2015, 2016, a big year to start talking about biased algorithms and biased data. So one thing I would like to point out here is I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler for language. And there's a term I like to call moral outsourcing. Um, it was first coined in Oxford with one of their AI groups. I think it's a very important distinction to make. If you are, are a data scientist or you work with algorithms, we, what we call a bias in an algorithm is a mathematical term, a bias variance trade-off. That's not what we talk about when we talk about biased quote unquote algorithms. We're talking about the ism, sexism, racism, right? And if you work with data, number, and algorithms, you know that computers are not inherently racist. Human beings are. So by using terms like um, a biased algorithm, the moral outsourcing part of it is we're, we're shifting the, the uh, agency from human beings, and we're shifting the moral responsibility from human beings, and we're shoving it onto a machine. What does that do? Twofold. One, it makes us feel helpless because some machine is making some sort of a biased, racist, sexist decision and I can't do anything about it. And two, it removes responsibility from the human beings and the agencies and the organizations implementing them. So uh, a lot of the examples in Kathy O'Neill's book um, and in general are about um, uh, credit decision making, right? About uh, educational initiatives, um, a big one was about parole, whether or not certain criminals should be up for parole, which ended up being a very, a very racist um, implementation. But again, the algorithm did not open the door for one prisoner and not open and open a door for another prisoner, right? It was a human being that took these actions. So I like to bring human beings back into the equation. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. And then we get to a more modern example, which escalates incredibly quickly from, you know, do we have biased implementations of algorithms to well, when our robot overlords come, according to Steve Wozniak, uh, what are we going to do? Are we just going to be pets, or are we just going to be in the way? And you know, I, I, my goal is to tone all of this down a little bit. So let's think about what 
the actual considerations are with artificial intelligence. So it is not an exaggeration to say that we are reaching a technological revolution that is going to be of the size, scale, and scope of the first industrial revolution. This is true. This is not an exaggeration at all. Everything we do, our jobs, our livelihoods, the way we raise our children, the way we go to work, the way we think about work, the way we think about our place in the world is going to change. And I'm actually going to give examples of why all those things will change. So we need to shift how we think about education. Current model, you go to school for n number of years, you kind of sort of study like poli-sci, then you end up a data scientist by some convoluted route, right? Um, and you've picked up sort of all this random knowledge along the way. Instead, we need to be more skills-based and goal-based. And we're seeing a lot of that come up with MOOCs, with things like Coursera and Udacity. So how do we take this model and shift it to affect the whole population, and not just young people, but also the people who are going to be affected by this new AI revolution, which is going to happen pretty quickly. So the second is work. What does it mean to have a job? Millennials started the trend of switching jobs very quickly, right? Getting, I don't want to say getting bored. I want to say seeing new opportunities and leaping at an opportunity. And it was okay if you, didn't, if you weren't exactly trained in that thing or that wasn't 100% what you knew or what you did. You went and you tried it, and if you didn't like it, you moved on to something else. And that's what work is going to become. We have to be more fluid with how we think about our jobs and our livelihoods and what it means to be human. So what does it mean when your teammate is an algorithm? When this algorithm is making decisions that are frankly more complex than the decisions you can make with your limited human brain. Also, then finally, who is responsible? Is the government responsible uh, for regulation, for the legalities of all the situations that are going to pop up? for all the people whose jobs are either going to change or whose jobs are going to become obsolete? Is it our job as human beings? Do, is the onus on us to constantly be learning new skills? Which may sound fine to most of the people in this room, but what if you know, think about your mother or your father or somebody 20 years older than you? If you went to them today and said, you need to change how you do your job, here, learn Python, um, you know, go take, and everybody's laughing. So I remember when my mom, uh, when they implemented SAP in her office, and she'd come home and complain every single day about all the stupid videos they have to watch, all the programming they have to do, and, you know, but these are the people who have to have their skill sets brought to speed. Mm -hmm. Or are companies responsible? Or somebody totally different, right? Maybe some international entity needs to be responsible. There's a couple of reasons why. Here's an example. Um, I'm just having an interesting conversation about autonomous vehicles. And it gets very philosophical very fast. So we all know the trolley problem, right? Uh, does, the, does the vehicle hit this group of people here? Does the vehicle hit another group of people there? Uh, do you spare the driver? Do you spare a pe the people in the crowd, right? Um, and that boils down to what the basic principles of your society is, right? Do you value the individual or do you value the crowd? So Mercedes-Benz came out with a very strong statement that their artificial intelligence for their self-driving vehicles would all be based on protecting the driver. That's a pretty strong statement. So if your car were to either run into a wall or plow into a crowd, a Mercedes-Benz vehicle in Germany would plow into a crowd and save the driver. Let's say you were crossing a border into another country and you're driving the same vehicle, and they've legislated the opposite. You must always protect the crowd over the people. What does that mean in terms of an implementation? Your algorithms for your car needs to be geofenced, and these algorithms change when you cross a border. So some very real, I mean, we, get, we go from philosophical to a very real implementation very, very fast with AI. So these are the considerations we have about artificial intelligence. One thing we're really talking about at Accenture, so we launched our tech vision initiatives last week. And one of them is, you know, they're kind of, you know, these, these bold statements. They're literally in giant bold letters. Uh, and one of them is AI is the new UI. UI spelled Y-O-U-I. What does that mean? So at Accenture, the way we're thinking about it is human-centered design. So the human at the center, let's think about things and its impact on people. So uh, is anybody here a designer from a design background? Yeah, because then you're laughing at us because you're like, I've done this, like, I get it. Which is funny because our, it's our design team that's teaching us how to think about things. Um, so an engineering solution, even a data science solution, is often optimized to your technological limitations, right? Uh, how much memory do I have? How much bandwidth? Is, does my data fit in the cloud? Or do, can I fit it on my laptop? 
Um, what's the thing that it's going to go on? Does it have to be fit for a mobile screen? We don't often think about what the person at the end of it, how they're going to be impacted by it. Why? To date, we've often had what's called human augmentation. Human augmentation is like my iPhone, right? It helps me do things, uh, but it's not impacting me. It's not making very significant decisions for me. So AI is different because AI does what we call enhanced judgment. Enhanced judgment may mean telling me something that I would not be able to figure out on my own, and that impacts my decision. So the directionality of impact is sometimes a little fuzzy. So here's a concrete example for you. Uh, last week or two weeks, we were talking about how there's a computer vision uh, AI that's able to detect skin cancer at the rate doctors can. So this AI will only get better. So once, once we've reached a skin cancer detecting bot that is better than any given human being, then it is now telling doctors this person has skin cancer, that person has skin cancer. That's enhanced judgment, right? That's maybe telling the doctor something that the doctor may not have noticed. He or she may not, not have noticed otherwise. So that, that enters into how we feel our place in the world is changed by artificial intelligence. So another part of human-centered design is creating a legal or regulatory system around AI that keeps the end user in mind. So again, uh, this gets very practical very fast. Let's think about industries with unions. Let's think about um, countries that don't have unions versus countries that do, or labor laws. And then as a result, how some countries might be left behind in the AI arms race. So in the US, there are certain industries that are very, very labor uh, and union driven. If uh, you know, I could go to a client and say, hey, we can just eliminate 75% of your labor force uh, with this artificial intelligence, and they'll say, well, that, that would be nice, or maybe I would think about it, but my unions will not let me. Which, you know, one can debate bad thing, good thing. The point being that maybe in another country, uh, they don't have these same restrictions and regulations. They're now the world leader in production of this particular product or good, right? So it will then impact GDP of a nation. By the way, I think there was a, a World Economic Forum report that said something like, Six to seven percent of a nation's GDP is going to be improved. Uh, of most Western nations, GDP will be improved by artificial intelligence. So, sounds like a small <coughs> number, but usually GDP, and we're talking about the gross domestic product of an entire nation, that usually doesn't shift up by more than a half a percent or one percent. Right? A one percent shift is massive, and we're talking five to six percent in the next, I think they said, few years. So it's it's a huge shift. So another thing we are really thinking about is a shift to uh, that will improve accessibility by income, race, gender, and ability. There already is a gender gap. There already is an ability gap. There already is an income gap. How do we do this so it doesn't make these things worse? So if to implement or use artificial intelligence, what do you need, right? You need uh, constantly working electricity. You probably need a good Wi-Fi signal. Plenty of places, that's already eliminated a large part of the world that is already a disadvantage. Now we're just going to make it even more, even worse. So uh, if you've read Thomas Piketty's Capital, he talks about how today income inequality is at the same level as it was during the Victorian era. Victorian era where one, you know, people in London were literally living under tunnels and underground because they have nowhere to live. And we don't want to make that worse, right? This is a wonderful, great technology that can do so much good. And it is a great equalizer, but at the same time we have to be cognizant that we don't leave people behind because we don't have to. That's the beauty of it, right? We don't have to leave people behind. So here's a, a few slides on approaching an ethical framework. This is from a Harvard Business Review paper. I thought it was a really great understanding of when one might want to use artificial intelligence and one, when one might not. So as a data scientist, I want numbers, right? I want a formula, I want to optimize that formula, then I'm happy, right? Uh, so what they, what they start to do is use something called the cost per mistake. So how bad is a mistake, uh, or how expensive is a mistake? So for a driverless car, the, uh, you know, a cost per mistake is quite high because it can mean a death, right? Versus, let's say, a computer vision program that will um, classify the inventory of a warehouse and say, you know, these are toy trucks, those are teddy bears, and, you know, uh, those are roller skates. If that messes up, cost per, cost per mistake, Pretty low, it doesn't matter. So it's one consideration you might want to have. 
Another one is explainability. We've talked a lot about explainability. Um, you've probably seen a lot of videos and discussions about it. Using black box models versus not, making your models more explainable. There are entire teams, and I feel like in the next few years, we're going to have fewer and fewer purely black box models, and uh, people are developing neural networks that uh, will sort of give you intermediate steps to explain its thinking along the way, and that should mitigate that a bit. So that's, that's a problem that's already being addressed. The last point, which is really interesting, is information symmetry. So what do you give versus what do you get? And here's a good example. Um, Laura's got a really cool, like at the bottom of her email, it's got like a picture and like, you know, the icons to link to her Facebook and LinkedIn. And I was looking, I'm like, oh cool, I want cool icons in the bottom of my email too. So there's this app you can use, I don't know if it's the same one you're using, Laura, but uh, you, you can put in a picture and all sorts of cool icons or whatever. And then uh, it integrates into your Gmail. Then, you know, before I agreed to it, it said, this app will have the ability to read and write to your emails. I'm like, it's really not worth having a pretty picture at the bottom of my email to give this company literally all the text of every email I've ever written. That's information asymmetry, right? I'm giving so much, and what am I getting out of that? Not very much, and we need to be more cognizant and aware of what are the, what's the information we're giving away. Everybody in here probably has some sort of a smartphone. The sheer amount of information we give away on a smartphone and how companies can use that information is staggering. And most people in this room are probably incredibly aware of that. It's only, you know, we're, we're moving towards data monopolies and more and more it, our data is going to be housed at only a few centers that are the central point. So Silicon Valley is built on after hires, right? Companies that buy other companies. Um, what happens when we have a data monopoly? When one company owns or you know, is a major <coughs> player that owns so much data, right? Our, your, the quality of your artificial intelligence is built on the data you have. If only two or three companies own all the data, then they're the ones that are always going to be successful. So now there's a very low barrier to entry to the AI market. What if this gets worse? These are all just considerations to have. So what do we need to do? We need to start approaching a regulatory environment. So end of the first industrial revolution, we learned that government needs to regulate. It did not go, go well when we let companies do whatever they wanted. And granted, companies of today, hopefully, if you're optimistic, you feel that they, they think very differently. First industrial revolution was all about how do we squeeze out the maximum amount of human labor from the seemingly unending pool of immigrant labor, right? That was pretty much how companies operated. That's what led to books like, um, um, you know, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and things like that, right? Making, building awareness around the use and misuse of human labor. So now we're, we're concerned about the use and misuse of data, of, of intelligence about us to use it against us or use it to manipulate us. So what can we do? One part might be certification. So um, you can certify people, right? People who are, you know, again, a lot of these companies that own this data or work these algorithms don't necessarily have bad intentions, right? I think a lot of this artificial intelligence, um, these mishaps that people talk about, like in weapons of mass destruction, it was not intended, right? Nobody, nobody meant for the parole determining algorithm to be racist. Nobody meant for, I think there was a, a beauty contest judging AI to be racist, right? It, it judged dark skinned contestants to be less beautiful than light skinned contestants. Um, so how do we then certify people for the things to look out for, to understand the context of what the algorithms that they're gonna implement? Another thing that can be certified are algorithms themselves. And finally, your data can be certified. Is your, data, is your training set diverse, literally? Does it have the parameters? Does it include dark-skinned people labeled as beautiful? Does it include non-Western standards of beauty, right? Um, so you can actually certify, after creating a regulatory framework, your people, your processes, and your data. <coughs> and you can create legal restrictions for what sort of decisions AI can make and how much, and how much a human can be removed from a situation. So again, going back to the doctor and diagnosing skin cancer. So the positive spin on it is doctors spend a lot of time with patients with very standard conditions. If you can have an AI that identifies a standard condition and say, oh, your rash, it's just basic, you know, it's just a basic rash you got from poison ivy, here's a cream you can use, right? And the doctor can instead focus on a patient with very severe eczema. 
instead of you know splitting their time and, and bandwidth between somebody who has a standard case and somebody who doesn't. But one thing you might want to be concerned about is how much of the doctor's time and consideration is the algorithm taking up, and how does the doctor feel in this environment? So how do we incentivize, right? So I'm talking this really lovely game about like, oh yeah, we can make regulations, but business has to buy in, right? People have to buy into it. And then we actually do have examples of this, this being done in the past. My favorite is lead certification. So how do we take a concept like sustainable design, green building design, and make it shift from things that hippies at Berkeley like to do to something that every company will proudly say, you know, if a company builds a lead platinum building, they will proudly proclaim that their building is fully green, right? It's lead platinum. Uh, you can go on tours of AT&T Park because it is a fully renewable stadium. They are very proud of that. They spent a lot of money behind that. How did we shift the mentality of the people who were building a sports stadium to agree to spend millions and millions of dollars for something like sustainable development? So that's one thing I'm looking at. Another is the organics industry. The organics industry is a really great example of standardization, regularization, one, of reducing people's fears, right? How do I identify what an organic product is? Is BPA, or not BPA, is BPA in my water bad? Um, is RBST in my milk bad? So how do we create standards around organics, which then, by the way, creates a premium product. We pay more for these high quality certified goods. So again, making the company feel that it's worth their time and effort. And if any of you have ever been in business world, there's Six Sigma. Six Sigma is like a, a universal, at this point, a training that you do to mitigate errors. It started at GE, I believe, but it's become the sort of global a uh, corporation standard for you know, training your employees on certain practices. So we do have uh, precedents for trying to create a framework around sort of this nebulous concept, maybe a bit of a do-gooder concept, and companies can and do buy in. And that's really, really important because we all have to be involved in creating ethical AI. So you can use an example of company-driven industry regulation, and they sometimes involve the government, so lead certification involves the government, and it creates standards around a premium product. So the last part, I sort of touched on it earlier. What does it mean for people? So creating an ethical framework, like I said, is human-centric. What does it mean to be human-centric? It's mentioning lifelong learning and skills-based learning. How do we create a curriculum that appeals to you at all stages of your life? A part of that is judgment-free or punishment-free education. The one reason why these online courses are so appealing is they seem like hobbies, right? Build an autonomous vehicle. Great, you're about to spend so many hours coding and building something and learning a skill, and I promise you if that were like a requirement for your major in undergrad, you would have like eye rolled at it, and you would have been so bored, it would have been so mm -hmm. annoying, because there's this sort of, there's a punishment aspect to it. You might fail the course. At least in online courses, if you don't show up, you know, there, we've learned that reward-based education works really well. So how do we do that, how do we shape education to appeal to a six-year-old, but also then further in someone's life, appeal to a 45 or a 50-year-old and give them something that's relevant. The second part is the, the impact on human psyche, and it's, it's no small thing. When do we stop becoming the decision makers? So if, um, I, I mentioned the doctors with the skin cancer, right? So let's say, let's say, you know, there's somebody who's, if there's a doctor who's job, and that's all, that's all they do is they, I, you know, they're a dermatologist, they identify skin disorders. Now there's this algorithm, and all it does is look at, like, scans a human being's body and, is set and just tells a doctor, prescribe this, this, and this, here's what's wrong with them. As a doctor, how do you then feel? The more complex the decision an algorithm is making, and the more of a differential there is between the decisions I'm making, which to the doctor is like, I'm a glorified pharmacist now. I'm just writing prescriptions, and someone's going to fill them. I want to be the person making the decisions. Human beings are very... We're egotistical, right? We like to think we're in the middle. We like to think we're in charge of our environment. How's it going to make us feel when our AI teammate is smarter than us, faster than us, doesn't need to sleep, and doesn't have a family? <laughs> so how will enhanced judgment affect how we see our place in the world? That's really the goal. And it's, it's to make people feel that their own judgment and their own ownership of the environment around them is being enhanced. They're made better because of the artificial intelligence. We want to move away from this idea of combating AI, right? Or we're moving away from this robot overlords idea. Or, you know, because I like formulas. 
what portion of the complexity of the task is, is done by the AI versus how complex is the task done by the human. And one really interesting thing to think about is I keep talking about changing AI to be human-centric. How are human beings going to evolve to be more machine-centric? So a really good example, every next generation we get, millennials and whatever they call generation after millennials, are more and more okay with having computers integrated into every aspect of our lives. I was reading an article about how millennials don't like to talk to people when you know when, when you call uh, customer service. We want to deal with a bot and much rather deal with a website and FAQ. The last thing you want to do is get a person on the phone. And that's a complete 180 from anybody our parents' age, right? Their first thing they'll say is, get somebody on the phone and have them help me. Uh, but for younger and younger people, we're totally okay with machines answering our questions and doing our tasks for us. Uh, so that's my last slide. So we didn't have any questions. So this is, uh, I just want to add a caveat. This is not meant to reflect uh, the thoughts and opinions of Accenture and some of the work I'm doing. A lot of, some of this is, you know, my work and what I'm working on. Um, and, you know, especially with the human-centric design, Accenture's really big on human-centric design. But I just want to say, you know, any opinions in, in here are mine and my thoughts. So any questions from the audience? Yeah? So what ethical, like, organization happens uh, well, IEEE is trying to make standards, um, you know, I know Stanford University is trying to make standards. I think that's what really needs to happen. So that's the first step in how LEED certification happened. We had, there was a, a bunch of different groups that came together and you sort of globally have to encompass enough weight, I guess. And the same thing with uh, organic certification, Oregon Till, right, they, they were just a well-known name. There's multiple different certifications one can get but that sort of became the standard. So that's a really good question. Somebody has to be the leader in it. IEEE is a good example of one. I know Microsoft has you know, their rules, but then you worry about a company being in charge of certification, right? I feel like a big part of um, getting people to be okay with this kind of technology, because you know it's all new and stuff, would be like, like, what would you say is the best way to get people interested in it? Like, there's a fear of this technology yeah. because of this. Yeah, um, I think it goes back to my first point about agency. As long as we feel like we're in control, and that's why some of this language is so detrimental, saying it's a biased algorithm or racist AI, we're, we're removing the human from the equation. And once we've done so, it's like we've not only as, as, a, as a species do we not have ownership, we also don't have responsibility. So that's I think that is what scares people the most, is this lack of agency and part of my personal mission, I think, is to bring the human back into the equation. And we, we are the agents of change in these things. These robots do not necessarily own everything and run every aspect of our lives. That's my good question. Yeah. So I guess my question is, um, if we have all the, you know, Terminator and all the, the stories, and it's like, if you can delve deep into sci-fi and mm -hmm, be like, absolutely. you can find some good AIs. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I guess my question is, other than stories, how are we supposed to change these, the, I mean, these thoughts, like she was saying, that, um, that it's going to be bad, you know, that um, if we don't watch it, someone's going to do something. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's almost akin to, like, Cold War fears, right, and, like, nuclear bomb fears. I mean, you think about um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The scariest part wasn't just that there was a country pointing <coughs> missiles at us, it was actually that you wouldn't even know if they set them off. And you wouldn't even know if three seconds from now you would die. That was the scariest part for people. If you could see the thing, that would actually be less scary than knowing nebulously this country is sort of pointing nukes at you and then you may or may not die. You know, and that, that's the part that's scary. So I, I think I'm just gonna go back to the human agency part of it. And I think we already are a lot more okay with robots and algorithms than we think we are. Um, we all have iPhones and our GPS, right? It, how, like, I've often wondered, like, how did I do anything before GPS? Like, I remember a time before GPS, but we all wonder, how did I do anything before GPS? We already have an algorithm map that tells us what to do specifically, and I will always follow it, <laughs> even if I know of a different route. It's like, well, Google Maps tells me that it's two minutes faster, so Google Maps must be right. <laughs> we already kind of do it. So I think it's just easing people into it. Any question in the back? Thanks. Uh, I, I may have only partially understood your point about the, the political science student and her, you know, what you call random knowledge, and 
what is your view of, um, of field knowledge in this moment? Yeah. Um, so field knowledge in terms of AI? <laughs> no, no, in terms of anything else. You, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure of your point about the yeah, yeah. Um, so I was talking about shifting education to be based on the skills at hand for your task at hand. So the other part is also shifting our concept of how we work. I was at a really cool dinner where somebody was somebody was talking about, we, the conversation started with somebody talking about how few companies that were huge in the tech world 10 years ago are relevant today. So this one guy had worked at HP, Yahoo, and Motorola. And you know, at 10, 15 years ago, these were the biggest names, and now they're, they're not players. Um, and this one woman said, well, why do we think companies even have to be around forever? Isn't that an antiquated concept? What if you just built a company like the way some nonprofits exist, and they exist to enact a mission and to be there for only five years? Why not? And that's true, I don't know, why not? So my point was more about what we consider skills to have a job can mean a lot more different things, and that is not something you can know uh, in the immediate for the next 40 years. Because at the fast pace of technology changing, uh, the needs and the skills that are valuable changing, we're just going to have to constantly be updating our knowledge. I was sort of cracking a joke about being a poli sci major and ending up data scientist. Um, but I will say that my political theory background informs me as data scientist a lot. That's actually why I am at Accenture today doing what I do. It's, it's also because I have a background in decision theory, right? So what do we think about political science? Um, how do you create a policy that, uh, in, that is making a hard and fast decision that will impact millions of people completely differently? Or, uh, even broader, how do you make a policy? Do you make one that helps the most people or hurts the fewest people? Right? I mean, we've been arguing that since, you know, forever. I mean, that's what governments deal with. And, and that, that informs and helps me be a better data scientist. Can you think of any AI applications right now with human-centric design? I think they're. I think we're battling with a bunch of different things. So there's AI. Is a, AI is a funny term. So you have the robotics part of AI, and then you can think about uh, all those robots are trying to make like the care bots and the nanny bots, and they're really concerned about human-centric design, right? If you want to make a robot to be a child's playmate slash babysitter, it's not going to be like six feet tall and hard edges, right? <laughs> not a great idea. You want to make it small and round and have a cute face. So they do think about it in that sense. Um, algorithmically, I think we're very naive in how we thought about human-centric design because algorithms are all about reducing your algorithmic bias, like bias in that sense, uh, you know, improving your predictive power. We worry about all these quantitative things and not so much about the end user implications. I think in that end, people are starting to get more sophisticated. That's why we have books like, like Weapons of Mass Destruction. It's to teach us that our algorithms have human impact, so let's make sure we build the human back into it. But I think the best examples are probably in the robotics part of AI. And can you think of any examples which you might have worked on bringing in the human-centric to change the algorithm to bring that sentiment out? Yeah. Um, my thing is always that there, that's the human agency part, right? So when you, um, you know, and also maybe the certification, like how, how do you know your data is not biased? So maybe the, the beauty contestants thing is a really good example. Um, who has won, um, na you know, national beauty contests in America is a reflection of Western standards of beauty. Right? So if you just naively, as the, the person creating the algorithm, just use the data set of every uh, Miss whatever, like USA, Miss World, whatever winner, what you will arrive at is a very Western standard of beauty, but you have to know the context. So I think that's where the human being really plays a role. You have to have a degree of subject matter expertise in the field. So one thing about artificial intelligence, by the way, is you know the big fear is that we're going to automate all jobs away and there'll be no human being. That's a ridiculous thing to do, frankly, because you need, you will always need subject matter expertise, like industry expertise, and that's only where the human beings will always play a role, especially with algorithms. Yeah. Um, when it comes to bias AI or AI, how much do sociologists or sociologists, how much are they playing a part in the conversation? Um, I was listening to this podcast about <coughs> you know, things determining who you belong to based on yep. And, um, and I think when, you know, things like race is used, mm -hmm. potentially maybe it's such a shortcut for something else. Mm -hmm. 
And I wonder, you know, in sociology and, and what they have determined in that field, yeah. um, you know, can help us better, you know, triage which sort of people that, you know, um, like babies would. Yeah. yeah. The short answer is yes, and the long answer is I wish they asked us more often because they don't. And you're right, race is often a proxy for income, right? Race can be, a, it can be a proxy for many, or income can be a proxy for race. It's often, you know, and then what do you do when you have two variables that are very highly correlated? Guess what, political scientists, sociologists uh, have been doing this for a really long time. I think there's more of a push, and that's why data science is a great and diverse field. You need all different kinds of people making these decisions. Um, so the short answer is yes, there are plenty of sociologists um, cultural anthropologists, political scientists who bash their heads against these problems. <coughs> so I was wondering if you would consider um, Amazon's product recommendation or Facebook's, what they choose to put in your timeline mm -hmm. news feed to be examples of human centered design. Maybe that's more like human optimized design. So it's sort of like, um, you know how companies will create food based on your taste buds and like how it deals with your dopamine levels so you can't stop eating it? That's actually what they're trying to do, right? I don't know if that's human-centric as much as that's optimized around, you know, trying to get human beings to use their product or engage with their product. So it, it's slightly different. So human-centric would be worrying about the human being and their wellness. I don't know if that's part of the intent behind a good product recommendation. If the objectives are not aligned. Right, right, exactly. I love that one. Thank you. Thank you.